So I was asked to talk a bit about the history of Sheik, where we come from or where we're going. So for that, I'll start by going back 1,500 years before Jesus Christ to begin the story by showing this tablet, which is written in Linear A, a language that we have completely lost. So now we are unable to decipher what is written on this tablet. However, what is interesting is to see that the message has still reached us. The information is there, but we no longer know how to decrypt it. So what we have lost is not the information, but the culture around it to be able to decipher it. I think we're changing the vision of telecommunications a bit. We're still sending, but here we need to focus more on receiving and how to process it. So we humans, we have our culture. Maybe we didn't know each other half an hour ago, and we are able to talk together and understand each other without too much trouble because we share the same culture. And computers, well, they also share a culture that started in the 70s with IBM. And then there was lots of things that led to a protocol stack. So, a stacking of different protocols that will perform increasingly precise function. And so, that is the means of communication for all computers today. So we had this convergence towards this universal culture for computers. I could talk about it for hours, but I was told I only had half an hour. So I'll just focus on two points on this model. The first one, which I find essential, is that it only one layer did not allow evolution. And so we have at the levels as interactions between two layers. We have an IP layer that offers great stability over time, meaning that it was standardized in the 80s, and we still use it in that way. And that is precisely a problem because we would like to move away from it, to go to the more modern IPv6. But it is hard because it's everywhere and it offers a very stable platform. And below that, we have technologies that evolve very quickly. Technologies that existed at the conception of the internet. We hardly use them anymore. No one talks about ethernet over thick cables anymore or token ring. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 4G, these are technologies that came after IPv4 standardization. So with this SIP layer that provides stability, it also provides great stability to the ecosystem, which allows us to make decisions saying, I'm going with IP, and I'm sure it will remain. Whereas if we go with a layer two technology, well, we run the risk that this technology will disappear, and all the work we've done will disappear with it. So that, to me, is an important point. The second important point is that by having this worldwide interconnection, we have also managed to achieve a miracle, the web, which is the interconnection of resources with each other through links. And the links are things like this. Now we're not going to go into details, but these are things that are very long. So they take up a lot of space during transmission. And in fact, in resources, we can put lots of things, but well-structured. But I'm not going to dwell on that today. So the problem is what was said, which is that in achieving this global interconnection, well, we weren't being careful with our spending in terms of energy or information transport. And so all these ecosystems are created on a waste of resources, but behind it is an enormous benefit, which is interoperability. The IETF, the organization that standardizes the internet, said, okay, we're going to try to reduce this by moving towards this six low pan technology, which involves reviewing all the protocols and trying to make them less costly in terms of transmission, and also less costly in terms of implementation to allow them to be put into constrained devices. And so, one of the first successes, as was said earlier, is Linky, the French electric meter, which uses these protocols. It's also why Sun on other countries. But we still need at fairly high data rates in the order of 100 kilobit per second with relatively large packets. And a new protocol standard has arrived, which is LP1. And we were lucky here at IMT Atlantique to be among the first to test these technologies, thanks to Curlink, who provided us with the technology. And there, it was euphoria. We have things that are energy efficient that allow us to do lots of things. We had forecasts 
that predicted 500 billion objects with these technologies by 2030. But behind that, we set off with Alex, Anna, to the IETF. And so Alex and Anna convinced the IETF. And that's what's nice about these standardization bodies. It's the openness. Meaning that two French academics who go to Japan and say, well, there's this new technology you don't know about called LP1. It's really important. And there's nothing from the internet that can work on it. They said, okay, show us that. We'll make a mailing list. And in six months, we managed to create a working group to work on this technology. Broadly speaking, Sheik generalizes what we had done in six low pan to all protocol layers, and not just IPv6. The compression of the IP protocol stack and the LMS is no day used on the Nemios, the meter provided by Italgas. That's a great success, but obviously there is a problem, which is that it's 500 billion, we don't have them. Ultimately, it kind of proved our intuition right that IP is essential because IP provides interoperability. So to achieve a massively scalable Internet of Things, we can't just focus on Layer 2, on transporting information and making it efficient. But we also have to look at the integration of the information coming from these objects into the information systems. So here, we try to do a little classification along four axes that seem important to us to lead to a massive Internet of Things. So we looked at energy efficiency because if we have to change batteries every day, it's useless. Interoperability to be able to insert it into existing systems, end-to-end -end security, because if everything can be tampered with, it's useless. And flexibility, meaning the ability to adapt to different environments. So if we look at LP1s, we're more in this category, meaning we're very energy efficient, we have relatively good security that's not completely end-to-end, -end, but is still very efficient. But, on the other hand, we don't really have interoperability. We have to develop new applications every time we want to create a new service. We can't plug into an existing service. The flexibility is also minimal. Since it's a protocol that has few possibilities, we can't do everything. We can't do video on it or anything else. But that's the trade-off. The Internet is more something that is very interoperable, that is end-to-end -end secure with all the encryption mechanisms, that is very flexible. Because we can do video telephony, we have lockdown, and we switch from Netflix to video conferencing without any problem. But we are absolutely not energy efficient. While the work of the IETF to be energy efficient allows us to meet all these points, but not really in a full, efficient way. We also have a tendency at the interoperability level. Since we have slightly better protocols, we're going to recreate silos and, paradoxically, we lose interoperability. And so alongside that, we have Sheik, so we can't win on all fronts. And so what we try to do is to take the benefits of IP in which we have interoperability energy efficiency, and end-to-end -end security. However, we're going to relax one constraint, which is flexibility, and so we're going to specialize the Internet to do a particular task. But obviously, we're not going to make a chic that is just for one application. And so we're going to introduce a concept, which is metaflexibility, meaning that we're going to put rules in place that are very flexible and will allow us to describe what we expect. And it's after, once we've applied these rules, that we'll be able to apply the compression. Let's see it in an animation. We have a packet that arrives. It's going to be scanned. We're going to look at what it corresponds to. We're going to compare it to rules. And then we're going to perform a compression that will remove the information that is present in the rules. Then. What we do is just add a small label at the level of what we've compressed to say which rules we used. And the decompressor, by retrieving the rule, will be able to do the reverse operation. And then, if the packet is too large, well, we'll be able to break it down into fragments. 
and the same principle, we're going to add a small label, which is a rule that will say which fragmentation algorithm we use. So that's the basic principle. Here we see it again on a slightly more academic slide. So the idea is to put a point-to-point -point convention between the object and the internet network in which we'll highly specialize the link. But on the way out, we'll be able to return to the internet world where we have everything existing, all the applications running. So the whole magic of Chic is to have a set of rules shared between two points. And if we have another object, we'll have another set of rules. Obviously, this can make a huge number of rules. And so that's a formal model. Afterwards, at the implementation level, there are plenty of tricks to reduce the steps. So let's talk about the advantages of Chic. Instead of always going towards more and more bandwidth and so on, it's about reducing the bandwidth of the links. So these are measurements that have been made. We managed to reduce IP traffic by 40 to 90 percent. We have objects that are much less energy hungry, meaning there are fewer batteries to replace and throw away. And then we have better network occupancy since we have shorter messages. So I think that's a message that is also important at the IMT Atlantic level which is to say that here we're pushing for a much more sober, specialized internet, but still flexible. So we're adapting it to a behavior. The second point is in terms of security, since we've defined a link that is tied to a behavior. If we have a weird behavior that shows up, well, it won't be described in the rules, and so it won't be able to go attack the object. So the baby monitor that does something else. That's not possible on that side. And the third point, which in my opinion is the most fundamental, is that we are revolutionizing the architecture of the internet as well. So with the classic internet, if we look at these two fundamental functions, the first is the datagram, meaning we treat each piece of information independently from the others. And the second is that we had the same packet format everywhere with chic and this is the only compression protocol that allows us to do this. We keep the datagram mechanism, but we change the, the datagram format. So we don't change how the applications work. We have a lot of flexibility at that level, and so that allows us to be very close to the current operation of the Internet, and also to have compatibility between different services, meaning we can have, as a block, a link that is specialized for sending alarms, another link in green that is specialized for sending information alerts, and we stay in the middle on the internet, and so we don't lose interoperability. And so that's an important point, and we can obviously go towards the cloud or towards classic services to manage that. So broadly speaking, I would say that Chic is a printer. So what we defined at the IETF is a printer in which we provide the mechanisms to write dictionaries that will allow us to move from a specialized internet to a general internet. Now, we are exploring some rules, but obviously there are still plenty to discover. So we talked a lot about terrestrial, but there is another environment where we have very low bandwidth. Even Sigfox is a high-speed network. Underwater communications where we're dealing with packets that are around 10 octets, but relatively slow data rates. And we can use Chic to make these systems interoperable. What we see currently is that we almost have no interoperability. Each modem manufacturer has its own standard, and the equipment doesn't talk to each other. So we can keep that, but by putting a very compressed layer 3 on the top, we can achieve interoperability. Let's talk about the lab chic which brings us together today. In terms of chic protocols and implementations, there are two main ones. There are others that exist, but which often stem from the open source solution. So we have Actility, which has two implementations, the network core side with IP core, and the side that we put on the device, we have the full SDK. So this is a professional product with a lot of documentation, 
that is ported to different boards with lots of testing. So it's really an industrial implementation of the protocol. And then on the other side, we have OpenSheek, which is a more academic vision of things, especially regarding its documentation. And so OpenSheek was actually created during the standardization work to test the hypotheses. So it's written in Python and is very flexible to add new features. However, it really struggles to scale up because that's not the goal. The goal is more to test, to do academic studies, or to teach how Sheik works. So what's going to happen with the lab Sheik? It's that the full SDK part is going to be put into open source, and so it will be open to everyone to be able to implement it on devices. And there it goes back to what we said at the beginning, which is that with the lab Sheik, we have a foot in both in the industrial world where we have to be efficient, we have to have products that work. And then on the other side, in the research world, where we're more testing new hypotheses. And so the goal of the lab chic will be to kind of guarantee this interoperability between the two worlds while respecting the constraints of both worlds. We're not going to ask Actility to implement the latest version of CoreConf because it's really great. We have three fewer octets. I think from an industrial point of view, there are other constraints and we have to respect them. But three fewer octets on the academic side, that's great. So in terms of the roadmap, we're in April and we've already taken it in hand. So Alex has already taken the stack in hand with the help of the Actility team. And so we've already managed to do a first phase of taking it in hand with a functionality, a focus first on all the compression, decompression. And so there we have compatibility between the two worlds, but fragmentation remains a bit more complex. So we have a little time left and our goal is to open up the code. End of June to be open source. In parallel with that, it's to develop new features as well, like the introduction, for example, of error corrections which are important in the metering world to make communications more reliable. And so we also have IETF milestones because we're going to use these tools to participate in standardization. And then towards the end of the year, open up the entire code and also work on more advanced features, like one which is management, which is going to become increasingly important. So just to give a few points on the standardization perspectives. First, I would like to say that Mr. Director, you are a very lucky person, because at IMT Atlantique, we actually have two blue dots, meaning two group chairs at the IATF. So they are part of the 5,000 people who decide the future of the internet and who chair the group. So we have Alexander Pelov and Aris Kutsiamanis, who is from DAPI department, who are group chairs, and so they influence standardization and also participate in the future of IoT. So quickly, the next step is with Anna. We're working on this point. It's all about architecture and putting Sheik into Sheik, so what we call layering. For now, they allow us to do what the IETF asked us to do, which is to take Sheik out of LP1 networks and put it everywhere on the internet. So there are plenty of interests, for example, compressing IPsec in 5G network cores. So there are plenty of potential applications behind that. And so that's a first evolution. The second one that is dear to me is everything to do with management. So how we're going to represent the rules. For example, between a Chinese manufacturer and a French manufacturer. How we're also going to be able to dynamically modify the rules and in particular. So Anna is also working on that. It's for protocol compression such as TCP, to significantly enhance their efficiency. Since we're discussing legacy protocols like Modbus or others, TCP becomes crucial. Therefore, 4G isn't solely focused on research anymore, but there are already notable advancements. So we've had, still with Anya and Ericsson, an RFC that describes how to implement SCHC in 4G network. Additionally, studies conducted by Aclio and Actility 
around narrowband IoT networks to optimize bandwidth utilization have shown that Sheik offers very interesting properties in terms of identifier stability we wouldn't have without this protocol, especially since, as seen on the slide, it saves a significant amount of wake-up traffic and timers that clear contexts and add them back afterwards, so it provides very good properties. Regarding 5G, I haven't described everything, but we can see that our favorite manufacturers have a significant number of patents related to Sheik or its positioning within the architecture. I just wanted to highlight that we have a 5G PIPR with Amina and we are working on integrating Sheik not by re-standardizing elements, but rather by attempting to use the current modular architecture to introduce it into the network in a fairly seamless manner. And then regarding 6G, which will eventually arrive. So, there are efforts around ambient EOT, which is a bit like large RFID, where powered by base station waves and can respond and send modulated messages. You realize that here, obviously, we don't have huge data rates, and Sheik is an important factor in providing interoperability for these elements. And then, the other important point is to see the convergence between 6 low pan and Sheik. So there are ongoing efforts, with Anna also involved, aimed at replacing the IPv6 header compression layer with something more generic that could address the entire protocol stack, not just IP. So, alongside that, we have this upcoming MOOC on Sheik, set to be released in June with a companion book, The Book of Sheik, which is currently being written. So, this is also an important phase for promoting the protocol. It involves courses, labs, and videos to explain how the protocol works. Finally, I tried to summarize this on a slide, so here it is. It's been a journey, and it's still quite a long and winding road, with potholes along the way. But we're getting there, and in seven years we've achieved quite a lot of miracles. Because initially it was IMT Atlantic with the Aklia spin-off that managed to push things to the IETF. Then, the standard reached the LoRa 1 level and was also adopted by ISO, IEC, and DLMS. So all of this is significant effort. And I believe that standardization is essential because without standards, we wouldn't have products today. Then, the standard reached the LoRa 1 level and was also adopted by ISO, IEC, and DLMS. So all of this is significant effort. And I believe that standardization is essential because without standards, we wouldn't have products today. The important thing is to have this interoperability. And if we had done our thing in isolation saying, here's Sheik, it's great. Well, it would never have been deployed because having these standards ensures longevity, and that's important. So, the journey continues, as we've discussed with meters, electricity, and gas meters, and others. So, we can see other verticals as well. We have everything from electric vehicles to smart buildings. We also have underwater transmissions, which are interesting, where she can be used. And then, beyond that, I would say, achieving the Holy Grail. But it's also recognition from other organizations like 3GPP at the 5G and 6G levels and the Wi-Fi Alliance also delving into ambient IoT. So Sheik has the potential to be everywhere for more efficient communications. To summarize, I would say, 